Comic Book Savant, episode 405. Welcome back to the Comic Book Savant Podcast. I'm your host, James Harris. This is the newest installment of Spinner Rack Bros. It is the um, podcast we do every month when it, I sit down with my uh, close friend, Heath Holland, and we come together and do a, a, a collab uh, podcast episode. Uh, this one is going to be a little bit different and a little bit different opening that you've seen from uh, any of the previous episodes. Uh, normally, before we sit down and record um, our episode, our newest episode uh, online, we kind of catch up and talk about what things we want to work on towards future episodes. And in the middle of doing that, we kind of spilled into a larger conversation. You'll catch that conversation in progress. You miss maybe like the first five minutes of even that. And we realized we had something going and we just started recording from there. We didn't cover the topic that we initially came together to discuss for this episode. We'll be doing that. And we talk about that in the episode that we're going to do that in a different format at a different time on Heath's channel. So be on the lookout for that. Also make sure you stay all the way to the end. It's some announcements toward the end that could be very helpful to you guys. Uh, so definitely um, stick it out to the end and check that out um, we had a real good time doing this it's totally like free form we talk about a lot of just different things related to the comic book industry um the movies everything else that's currently going on so it's really a kind of um uh state of the union kind of addressed uh, towards the state of the comic book industry currently and it was just a really fun sit down conversation between two friends nothing we had nothing out pre-planned this was totally us just passionately talking off the top of our heads and it, i think it came out rather nicely so i hope you guys enjoy um i will see you guys again next week for another episode and um again enjoy and don't forget to leave comments and hit us up on um, social media as well to let us know what you thought of the episode and if you would like to see more episodes like this one uh, for future installments of Spinner Rack Bros. You guys take care and we'll talk to you soon. Uh, you asked me if I was going to see Aquaman and I was like, I, mean, I guess I am because I can go see it early and I can talk about it on my channel and it'd be kind of good you know, like, to get some views and I get my opinion out there. But I'm not excited about Aquaman because, you know, here's the number one reason why I'm not excited about Aquaman. He does not look like Aquaman. Like, why have they taken such a strange departure with this guy? Of Like, he looks like he's in a grunge band or like a, a goth band or something. Like, right, but then at the end of the trailer, they throw him in, like, the traditional Aquaman suit. And it was like, it, that makes it okay. Like, at the end <laughs> of the trailer, like, when he emerges and he's, like, in the old... And I, that's weird. It's just weird. Um, they don't know what they want. They have no idea what they want. Like, you, you said... What did you say about... Um, this before you hit record. What did you say about uh, Warner Brothers, what they should be doing? I mean, I just think they... Uh, here's the thing. I feel like they're just tone deaf. They should have... Like I said, because they own all the characters, just be true to the characters. Get people that are passionate about the characters. Let them write in and do the movies. They tamper so much. I, I mean, they say what Patty Jenkins... You know, they didn't... You know, but like you said, that parts of it, it comes off scatterbrained. People like... Love, it was a darling because... Everything else was so bad. It was kind of like you said about, about Aquaman. I think Wonder Woman gets a little bit too much love because it was the one movie they didn't F up. So it was like, it was okay. But the other ones were so bad. It was like, so it became this darling of a movie. And like I said, I enjoy the movie. I like, I enjoyed that. I like Chris Pine as an actor. I like, you know, Gal Gadot and, you know, to see her in that role and, uh, the female empowerment and how the little girl, like all that was awesome. But as far as the movie and the merit of the movie itself, it's not the best movie. You know what I mean? Because it gives you the feels like you elevate it a little bit more, but based on if you're just a true critic, you know, examining that movie, it's not great. It's not a great movie. It's, it's, it's like you said, it's decent at best, but it, it gets to a good or great status because of look what came before it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, it's half of a good movie. Right, half. right. It, and, I, it, it gets about halfway there. The last half, the, the latter half is really good. I don't think any of the origin stuff really works in that movie. Not 
for me, at least. But, but, like but again, I feel like I'm so much of it, Wars. so much of it got shifted because of Justice League. Because you know yeah. you have to you have to remember they had already shot because it was supposed to be two movies. They had already shot Justice League and was working on Justice League Part Two. They then they they scrapped it, rewrote certain things. So they shot they shot Justice League like two and a half, almost three times. By the time Whedon came in at the end, they pretty much had shot that movie three times, and it was footage from Part One and Part Two that um, Snyder wrote. You know, and every time you have, I know you just. I was watching your um, Black Friday haul. Have you watched Justice League yet? No. Okay, you'll see the tonal difference. If you didn't see it in the theater, you'll see a tonal difference in the movie where, like, Zack Snyder's Aquaman and how he acts as Aquaman, and when you first see him at the beginning of that movie, you could clearly tell that was Zack Snyder's because he was darker. He he was more interesting. Then all of a sudden the movie shifts and he's like surf the what we see now, the surfer bro grunge band guy. Like his whole attitude totally changed from the first scene to when he re emerges in the movie and the team comes together and all that. And you could be like you know, it's like they were like, Hip him up, he's too brooding, he's too dark. We can't do dark because Marvel doesn't do dark, so we gotta lighten him up and we gotta make him a surfer bro. And I was like I was liking and it was showing that Momoa could act. And I was like, it's, and you see that scene in the beginning with him and um, that they show in the trailers where um, Ben, you know, is going to the fishing village looking for him. And his whole, the scene they have is great. And it's like, yo, they're really going to show that this guy has some chops and he's going up against Ben. And I was like, that scene is so great. And then it's just all wiped away to the surfer. And I was like, I didn't like, I like what I saw in that scene. And I know that was Snack Snyder's doing. And then they, they, they took it all away. And, and I haven't recovered from that, I don't think. I, I liked what I saw there. That was the Aquaman that that I wanted. And you took it from me, and I can't get it back now. Because, you, like you said, you can't make up your mind what you want to do and where you want to go. And you, you, you picked the wrong direction. That's why the whole Flash movie now is probably never going to happen. Because it's, it's been in such a limbo. You stifled so many. You brought so many di- directors on that you hired that probably would have did the best movie because they liked the character. And because you effed him up so much in Justice League and they want to fix it, you don't want them to because you think that was the right direction and now you're stuck and now the movie probably never get made. I, I was just reading something online, some of the movie reports were saying that pretty much now the Flash movies totally lost steam over at Warner Brothers and probably will never happen. Never see the light of day. You know, but they hired like seven different directors for that movie. It's just part of the problem. There's right. no single vision. There's no single vision in, in the... um. And the leadership structure, they, they fired the old group, but least movies were coming out. Since the new the new guy came up, what, I think um, the new guy was hired, Aquaman will, I think, will be the first movie under him being with the company. At least other movies were coming out, you know, to say, at least I give them that much. But they keep announcing stuff. They didn't stop announcing stuff when the new regime came in. They kept announcing, um, um, what is it, uh, the um, new gods and... And Blackhawks and all these other movies. You counted at one point. It was like 40 movies that they had greenlit or something like right, that. Right, right. <laughs> Cy- we're a Cyborg. Now you're still supposed to be doing a, a, a Green Lantern movie, a Green Lantern Corps movie. And, you know, um, the, what, the Cyborg movie's not happening now? Um, Probably none of them are happening because they haven't figured out where to go yet. You can't. You can't plan ten steps in advance. Well, you which, but they are, are, but they are because they're moving forward. They're fast tracking the Birds of Prey movie. Like that's that's gonna happen. They're, they're you know still gonna be a Suicide Squad two. Like that's happening. Um, like no, they still got movies going. Um, that's the crazy part though. But they've learned nothing. They've they, done not at all. Done. Not at all. It's it's a hot it's a hot mess and it's disheartening. You know, like I don't. And here's the crazy thing. I dig this. I haven't watched any of the CW shows this this year. Um, I don't know. I, just, I think I'm just in general like burnt out on television in general because um, I was you know for the sh- for the sh- you know shows I was watching them all like all the CW ones and you know I was watching like Star Wars Rebels and I would report about that and The Walking Dead. Like I kind of got burnt out over the last year. I got to the end of the season of everything and then I was just like I thought I was going to be like back on that because I've been doing it for a few years now. And then when the season came back around, like I, it was cool having the summer off and 
not having to worry about every TV show and you got to watch them in a certain order and blah, 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 and this break and trying to keep up with all the storylines. When when it, when the new season started, I didn't. I found myself I just didn't care anymore. Though certain ones I enjoyed more than others and all that, but even the ones I enjoyed, I haven't not been compelled to be like, let me pull that up and and watch that right now. I, I don't really care, and I don't feel like I'm missing anything. I, I don't think you are. You know, they're just, they're not going anywhere either. It's like that's, that's true too. That. And I think I'm realizing that now. I mean, I, I really think I'm realizing that now. And then I, 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 you know, you know, certain things like as a creator, you know this. You know, doing the website as well as you know the YouTube channel. Sometimes you worry about like, do people care? You know, when I I spend all this time watching these shows and I'm reviewing them and I'm passionate about them, and then like you get the numbers back and you're like, well, do people really care? Like certain things gather steam with time, you know, because it's like okay, it's a lot of work goes into that. Where it's like I watched 24 hours of this show this year to write this review and do this video or do this podcast is like. Five people watch the video on it. It's like, well, is it, you know, was it really worth it at the end of the day? Like, because some of the stuff, you know, it's like, because I'm a, I'm, 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 you know, a completist. I, you know, I have to, you know. So if I watch one episode, I'm gonna pretty much watch all of them, unless it's just god horrible. But if it's comic book related, I can kind of plow through it because I can glean some, uh, some happiness out of it just because it's comic book related. At the end of the day, I could justify it in my mind. And um, and I was like, well, do I want to keep doing it to myself? I'm not thoroughly enjoying it. And the only current superhero show that I'm watching right now is Titans on DC Universe. But I'm, that show, I saw the first episode, and I was like, what is this? And amazingly enough, it has turned itself around, and it is really good. That's the only thing. Wow. It's really good. And, and, and not everything is pitch perfect, but I mean, they've done some really, and this, and this is the crazy part too, Greg Berlanti is producing this show as well. And it's shot up in Vancouver, you know, like with the other shows, but they gave, they gave him the license with this show to kind of Marvel Netflix it. It's a little bit more adult. Uh, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I love Dick Grayson and they, you know, I'm, I talked about it in the video I, that I did about it on YouTube about I didn't like the natural, the natural depiction. The original way we're introduced to Dick's character in the like pilot episode, um, they've tweaked it some, but they have him being a slightly more darker, more Bruce-like Batman instead of the more well-adjusted individual he always came off in, in the comics. Which I have, I have the problem because you know he is like my favorite character ever in comics, so I've adjusted to it because. They're, they went so far to the to the left. They're bringing it back to the center slowly, and they're they're giving you're getting the um, they're unraveling the mystery on why he was so left. It's a reason for it, um, and they they slowly and they've kind of revealed it to this point. And now he's like he's re, he rebuilding himself to be that character we know him as, which is oh. which is he has a, it has a true arc to it. He's his character has a true, fully formed arc, and it's thought. And you don't think it's thought out how they introduce it, but as each episode comes along and you see his progression, it's there. All the characters are so well um, realized. Like it's kind of weird because they marketed it it's so wrong. Warner Brothers is horrible at marketing their own stuff. They don't know their own product. No, they don't. I they, want to talk about that. Too. Yeah, they you, don't you know. Their back to that. Yeah, it is insane. That show is freaking amazing. Like they they've already had Doom Patrol in the show. Like they went comic. They went. They don't skip yeah. on the comic book stuff. They like went comic booky. Like it, you know what I'm saying? It's like Doom Patrol's like in the fourth episode. They done had Hawk and Dove, and they, like they've had some like legit comic booky stuff. I never thought I would see. You, we've already seen it already. You know, and, and I'm like. Dang, that's all, that's going to be a show. That's going to be one of the upcoming shows. Is Doom Patrol, and you got them like in four episodes in. You got Hawking Dove in like the second episode, and it was like it was awesome, you know. So it's oh, really good. I just want to go back and talk because what you're talking about is saying that like mm-hmm. Warner Brothers doesn't know their characters, and they don't because that's part of the problem that we're having with the movies is that you know you were talking about Aquaman and how you miss the the darker take on that character. I mean, every character, this is something that I feel like I've 
argued with some people about before, but people are like, well, comics, you know, comic characters can be anything. They can be stretched because, you know, like Batman, you can have this, the goofy 60s Batman and you can have the um, the gritty Frank Miller Batman. And that that's true. Batman can be bent a little bit. But I feel like there is a core to these characters that goes back to the 30s for most of them. Um, right. And so Superman is not your sacrificial lamb. He's not rooting and like sad. Superman is hopeful. Superman is optimistic. Superman is going to be, he knows it's going to be okay. He's going to do everything he can to make everything fine. Batman is your detective. He's distrusting, but he's also a hero at the end of the day. Um, that's your, that's your dark character. If you want a dark character. And then Aquaman is your noble regal, kingly character because he has a responsibility of the kingdom on his shoulders that he's torn with you know he, he does he want this responsibility does he not it's almost like a lord of the rings kind of thing so to take that character and make him a surf character is such a such a mystery now i think they did kind of do a take on that in uh, the brave and the bold uh, that, that batman brave and the bold series um, mm-hmm. where aquaman was kind of kind of goofy and fun that's fine for that, but it just reads as like, like Warner Brothers doesn't know the core of these characters, and you can tell because they'll bend a character to be one way in one movie and another way in another movie. Right, exactly. That's what. And this agree. problem goes back decades. You can even go back to okay, then we have Batman nineteen eighty nine, which is chasing the Frank Miller Dark Knight Returns, right? But also trying to service like Tim Burton and his weird, like the the unique Tim Burton view of everything and I like, have the like Beetlejuice or whatever like I don't know like it's it is like 50% Tim Burton and 50% uh, Frank Miller to me right. and then you can see like that was successful and then the, the next one Batman Returns is like a darker and even it's like Tim Burton's like <laughs> dream it's like oh this is gonna have to be like black and white everywhere and England's gonna be this weird little lumpy guy with all these issues like and then and the Warner Brothers was like, that was too dark. So we have to go the complete opposite, opposite direction. Exactly. <laughs> and we have to make Batman, like, like now there'll be all these fun colors. Now, Joel Schumacher has kind of fallen on the sword for that. I think he take, takes a lot of responsibility larger for that. But there's this, and then, and then, of course, they go even goofier with it for the fourth movie and basically killed Batman for, for a few years there. Or you couldn't even approach that character, but it like it's a story that Kevin Smith tells where he was gonna he was meeting to talk to, to write the Superman, the Superman Returns, right? And uh, like the exact like he was like they had hired him, Warner Brothers had hired him to write the movie. And he's like, I mean, I'd love to do it, but why don't you get one of the cats that works in the comics to come do this because that's what they do. And Warner Brothers, the executives told him, no, 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 that's that, that's over there, comics. The comics are their own thing. This is the big leagues. We don't have comic book writers write our stories here. This is this is a whole different level. And I honestly don't think anything has changed in the last 20 years since that story, or more than that, since that story first took place. Because I still think they have that mentality. Like, well, comics are one thing, uh, but to come up to the big leagues, we have to have – we have to change. We have to elevate them to something else. Yeah. And you can see that because there was a story going around that in the Wonder Woman movie – that they want the executives wanted to cut the trench scene where Wonder Woman like storms the, best the scene trench. In the movie. That's the best it's, scene. It is literally the best scene in that movie, and they thought that it was superfluous, as I think for that it wasn't necessary, and that it just slowed the film down. I'm like, no, no, that's the one moment in the Wonder Woman film that, that actually makes felt the like movie. Wonder Woman. That makes that that was the moment in the movie. Was like it was worth me going to see when I saw that. It made me feel an emotion towards that character. And at that moment, I connected with the character. Like, she is my Wonder Woman. You know what I'm saying? It is, like, it is unabashed heroism. It is, exactly. It is a hero being a hero for no other reason than it's the right thing, thing to, to do. do. Exactly. It's not a personal vendetta. It's not a grudge. It's a hero saving people because that's what heroes do. And they <laughs> thought that that was unnecessary. Yeah. It, it's, it's crazy. And, I, and like I said, it's, that's their biggest problem while they're losing is it's just because they don't know they're they're so out of touch with their um, product and they could be making so much money hand over fist you know and I'm I'm gonna do um, a revisit on you know DC Universe but we can, like talk about it here is that you know it's such they made so many bad decisions like I've, I've been signed up for it since it launched so what I think is we're like. Th- 
I don't know, like three months in or something like that now. And it's like, it's, it's crazy because the service is so uneven. Like they have like the whole comic book thing. And I, I don't, it's, it, I still don't like it. Like, I still don't like it because it's, it's like, okay, they added like more comics to it, but everything is like time gated. Like, because Titans is on right now, they have so many issues, and they added more of the issues and the story arcs and stuff, so they did improve on that. So it's like huge runs and plugs of Titans and the Teen Titans, the original Teen Titans, the Jeff John, all the different eras of Teen Titans that if you got the service, you can log in and you can read it to your heart's content. Awesome. But it's nothing current. It's all this stuff from that you can buy now on Comixology or DCComics.com when it's on sale for four or five bucks the trades and read them yourself and then you know you could you you know you have unlimited access not that it's going to be time gated for a month or two months and then i was like looking at let me go back now and see what the movie offerings are like okay i think before i counted i said it was like 30 movies now it's like 34 but then like the um the nolan batman movies when the service launched and it was batman they were on there they're not. They pulled those movies, um, and now it's just like the Tim Burton, Schumacher ones. I think are, are the ones that are available on there. Um, <clears throat> they haven't added more of the animated movies. It's the same group of animated movies, um, but I guess going forward, all the newer ones is I guess is how they're positioning that. That you will then be able to get through the service, or shortly after they come out, you'll be able to watch them on the service. So it's cool for that. The, still, the strength of the, the service is centered around the original content because Titans is really good. Um, they made a mistake because I feel like they would have gotten more publicity if they had marketed that show properly. And they, because the, the season was already done. Because when they went to San Diego Con, they said it had been wrapped for a while. And as soon as they left Comic Con, they, they had been renewed for season two and they were going straight into filming season two of the show and they're already in production on doom patrol like halfway through production at that point they were already they had just started production i think because they showed um brandon fraser did a remote low a locale thing from from the set during comic-con so that show you know that should be well and that was what july we're in december they should be done with that by now um i would have and i think the biggest mistake was they probably should have waited another year and had all those shows in the can and then let them be binge bingeable because like the most frustrating thing is to watch how good an episode is and then it ends on a great cliffhanger and you're like freak i gotta wait a whole week to get the next episode i like that's what i watch network television for when i pay for a streaming service just give it all to me so if you hooked me and i'm into it let me watch it the whole thing and then i can I then, then, then me as a content creator, if your show is really good, if you can't market to yourself, let me express how good it is and hopefully bring eyes to your product. Give me that option that, you know, I can pull more people in. They didn't have any confidence in the show to let it be what it really and truly is a good show. And, you know, you focused on F Batman, stupid stuff that was just like one second, you know, and one episode and like, at least we're edgy and we're dark because dark's good, right? But no, you just renounce darkness in all your movies and try to be like, because Marvel's like, which one are you? You know what I mean? It's it's uh, it's, it's crazy, and you know, and I, like they just need to lean in to. We believe in the. I don't think they believe in anything they're doing. They just throwing stuff out there to, like you said, to see what sticks. And when when one negative thing comes out, they jump to well, well, we'll, we'll go. We went left. Now we're gonna go back right. Without any consideration for it whatsoever, it's a mess. Who's who's the guy in charge of the Warner Brothers creative direction these days? You know, I know it's not Jeff. I know Jeff Johns is high up, but he's like, is there one guy? No, who's he's running not everything? even with them anymore. Remember, he was had, he not? He he no. When they fired the last guy, they um, gosh, what's his name? I I, I talked about it on the podcast. I don't is um he was the guy that's over the DC film division now was the guy that um, James Wong, um, he was the head of the horror division that was, he worked very close with James Wong. He came over from the horror division to run the DC Films division when they fired the last group of people. And so Jeff, what they did with Jeff Johns 
before they were going to, they, because they like him so much, he was going to get fired. But what happened is he, he left all film duties behind and they gave him this sweet production deal. So he's, he's not even in the hierarchy anymore as a, as an executive at DC or DC films. He, he let all that go. He, they like right when he was going to get fired, they gave him the heads up. They gave him a sweet production deal. He started his own production company. So that's why he's back to writing comics. He's and he's um, executive producer on the, the different shows. He's executive producer on with Greg Berlanti on Titans. They gave him Star Girl. That's through his production company. Um, and he's a co-executive producer for the Green Lantern movie um, as well. Uh, I can't remember what his uh, production company is called, um, but yeah, he formed it right when all that was going down, and he was going to get fired. Um, yeah, and he uh, formed a, a new company, and they gave him this sweetheart deal uh, to to you know pretty much help him. So who, like in Marvel, Kevin Feige is the guy that's basically running. He's the guy with the plan. And he loves the comics, and he has a history with the comic. Now, I know that some people will be like, oh, Kevin Feige's messing stuff up. But I, like, I've listened to interviews with Kevin Feige, and I think that he legitimately loves Marvel Comics, and he has things that he wants to see because he's a fan first and foremost. Um, who is the person that's doing that at the DC at the Warner Brothers? Was it Zack Snyder? No. Or was there somebody over him? No, um, but, but, but it was... Who's the new guy? Um, Tyler so Schneider to... was executive producing a bunch of stuff. I think he still is. I think he's executive producing Aquaman. Okay, well, that's who it is. Okay, so it was um, the two heads before was John Berg and Jeff Johns. They fired John Berg, and then they gave Jeff Johns the heads up, and that's and then that's when he departed DC wholly, and then they gave him the production deal. Then the, the new president of DC Films was then... Um, Walter Hamada, that's the guy. I, 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 I was trying to remember his name. Walter Hamada, which he um, he was um, he was the head of the horror division at Warner Brothers, and they brought him over. Um, I guess James Wan talked him up. You know, he made him a ton of money with The Conjuring and all those movies. He was overseeing that whole division, um, and um, they brought him on because that was just about a year ago. Now it was. Uh, I'm looking at this article here from Variety. That was a uh, when all that was announced was like Jan- the very beginning of the year of this year, January 4th. <clears throat> um, when all that um, happened, but uh, before that point, yeah, it was uh, John. So the the Kevin Feige Feige's because they had, they had a, it was a co role was John Berg and Jeff Johns, and they were going to fire him, especially after everything happened with Justice League because that was considered under his watch as co-head. That's why he was going to get fired. Um, and let me see what this is. Um, yeah, this was back in June. So, um, bu- 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 this is Hollywood reporter. Um, he's stepping down from his executive post and entering in an exclusive writer producer deal with Warner brothers in DC. Um, mad ghost productions. That's his production company. Um, yeah, so he's no longer like any type of executive level at um, at Warner Brothers at all. He's freelance, and he just has this partnership with his um, Mag- Magos Productions company. Well, I, I bring all that up to say that it just doesn't seem like there's a vision. The yeah, I, they, they, you know, I was because they were just saying they were praising Hamada on you know all the stuff with the Conjuring and. You know, all the connected and the spinoffs and, you know, how they had like that joint universe thing. And, and, you know, they thought he was going to bring this leadership over. I I mean, I think Aquaman is going to be the first movie to kind of see, you know, then maybe Shazam. We know that's what Shazam's coming in like February. Um, You know, but now they've delayed Wonder Woman. So Wonder Wonder Woman was going to be next year. But now it's 2020. Um, we have no, still have no Flash movie. I'm assuming maybe since they're looking to fast track Birds of Prey, I think Birds of Prey shoots in, a, in like June. They said they're aiming for like a early summer uh, shoot shoot schedule. 
So I'm assuming maybe because we're going to have a long stretch if we don't have we have Shazam in February. Um, what uh, Wonder Woman was supposed to be like June and now it's going to be uh, I think it's like early 2020 or something like that or summer 2020. So um, they, they're going to need something. So I think that's why Birds of Prey is kind of getting fast tra track. So maybe it'll come out uh, late 2019 or very early um, uh, uh, 2020 to, to hold, you know, but it's this huge gaps there. They're losing, with, considering they own all their characters and all their rights, they should be more together and having stuff for all the stuff they announce. They should always have at least one movie in production somewhere to keep the um, public awareness of their universe and their characters going. And they don't. And they uh, for all the stuff they announced, you know, like you said, none, most of this stuff probably is never going to see the light of day at this point now. It's, it's a mess. You know? It's, it's totally a mess. And just so that I'm not being nothing but negative, like, uh, we've, we've leveled a lot of criticisms here. But here's what I think that they should be doing. This is my, this is my constructive criticism. Warner Brothers has something that Marvel doesn't have, and that's a, a deeper legacy for these characters. They have three to four generations of these characters and these legacy characters, you know, uh, Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age. So they, they have all these different levels. You, you have three or four, I got more flashes than that, but um, they could, what I feel like they need to be doing is they need to have somebody overseeing these that has a deep history with the comics Maybe somebody like – not necessarily saying this person is, is great for the role, but someone like this. Um, uh, Dan DeBio over the comics. Like Dan DeBio comes from comics. He knows comics. He knows those characters. If you had a Dan DeBio type personality to be running the movie – not running the movie division, but overseeing and making sure that continuity is there. And that most importantly, first and foremost, that the movies represent the characters – as audiences recognize, as we already know, Warner Brothers has tried to reinvent these characters for a new audience. And I think that's a mistake. That, that's my personal opinion, but I think it's a mistake. I think you need to tap in to what has made these characters uh, special for, I don't know, what, 80 years? Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, they have they have all these characters. They have no reason to – they own them all. They, there's no reason that there should not constantly be one of these movies in production. They don't have to be $200 million epics. Exactly. They Exactly. It's a fifty million dollar, I don't know, Blackhawks. Isn't it Blackhawks? Isn't that the name of the group? Yeah. Make a make a fifty million dollar, you know, whatever. Make a make a spy movie. Start with some of these smaller genres. Make sure that it's true to the character, that it captures what's cool about that character. Look, the TV shows are doing it and succeeding with a fraction of the budget. Like people love. I know you're taking a break right now, but people love the Arrowverse. They love the Flash. They love. Uh, I think even Supergirl is doing really well right now. Those movies, or those shows, don't have a huge budget. Like you said, they're shot up in like Vancouver. So, mm -hmm. but they're succeeding. They found an audience. That's another thing. Why do we need two separate universes for these characters? Why do we have a TV universe and a movie universe? Because when you've when when an audience has connected with the Arrowverse, and then you've got these characters appearing in the movies, and they're not the same characters, they're not the same actors, it's not the same universe. You've, you've said that one of those is more important than the others, mm -hmm. and that's not that's not wise. So, like, Flash, probably never going to get a Flash movie now, because the Flash on TV is doing well. Well, if Flash on TV is doing well, why do we need a movie that's trying to say, like, but this is the real Flash? <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like it's, it, it's not that hard. These decisions are not that hard. It's not as – you don't have to think about it as much as they're thinking about it. You take your characters – they're popular for this reason. You make a movie with them. You send them on an adventure. Uh, you know, the, like I said, these do not have to be these massive, multi-hundred million dollar budget things. Just pick a character, tell an interesting story, and people will show up. People have really lost faith in the, the DC product as far as Warner Brothers movies goes because they've been burned over and over and over again. I, I totally agree, and it's bad that the movie I'm most anticipating from them. After I saw the trailers coming out of Comic Con, was not Aquaman. It was Shazam, and a movie when they announced it, I had no interest in. And when I first saw the first pictures, but I felt like for the first time, 
they're they're committed to a tone for a movie, and I felt like they were they're aware of what they're trying to do with it, and it fits the the what they're going for in that movie. You know, now I'm not I don't, I'm not steeped in the Shazam lore to know how um, accurate it is, but just far as a comic fan and a movie goer, it looks truest to um, you know like hey, we're gonna aim this towards kids. So this is going to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more comedic, and it works. It looks like it works. They look like they picked the right actor. They got the right director. You know what I mean? Will it be great or bad? But it, it has me interested to want to go see it. I'm only really going to see Aquaman is because I, I do the content and I watch. I go see all these movies. Like I said, I'm a completionist. I can't help myself. I pretty much go see any large you know, comic book movie pretty much at this point is what I've done. It's what I do. And I review it and give my thoughts to be a bigger, you know, hopefully, you know, um, you know, advise, you know, the listeners on if it's worth their time, investing their time. You know, I, I fall on the sword, so they don't necessarily have to in a lot of cases. So it's just something I do. But I can say um, where I was anticipating Wonder Woman, even I was kind of excited about. Batman v Superman when I when it first was out to go see it um I have no intent like they burn me to the point where I'm like I'm just so indifferent to Aquaman at this point do we spoil an element of Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice has it been enough time that we can talk about something that happens in that movie yeah I think so yeah if you guys haven't seen Batman vs Superman and you don't want anything to spoil just tune out for about 15 seconds uh, I was excited about that movie too because though it did look awfully dark for the subject matter or like for those characters, at least for Superman. Uh, I had it had my goodwill, and then like I tried to watch the extended director's cut, or whatever they're calling it. And like in the first ten minutes, you kill Jimmy Olsen, who is such a critical character to Superman. Like Superman loves Jimmy Olsen, regardless mm. of what timeline. Superman loves Jimmy Olsen. That's his buddy. And I feel like that was such an f you to fans. It was like, oh look, we're not taking in. Nothing safe here, you guys. This is a whole different era for Superman. And that's that's that Zack Snyder darkness that we're talking about. And that just seemed like such an affront to the spirit of that character. And it lost me. It just lost me. And it didn't I was make never- any sense. It, it made no sense. Like, it was it was so weird that it was that. Because it was like, oh, you saw the badge or whatever ID. And it was like, oh, that was, that was Jimmy. It was so and then he was like, uh, wasn't he was like supposed to be like a, he was a federal operative or CIA operative or whatever. He wasn't even yeah. really, it was, it was, that was just dumb that they named him Jimmy. He just could have been whoever. I thought that was just dumb. That, that I think it was there to shock people. That's right. What I think. Right. Um, I, I can see that. I like that extended cut better than the theatrical cut by a lot. Um, I think it gives more. Is it good? Huh? But is it good? I would say from I here's the thing. Um, I always have this debate. I I look at Batman v Superman and Man of Steel as one movie with the extended cut, and I judge it based on that. If it's the story that's established in Man of Steel and it continues on with thread points, and I feel like as a complete work. I think it's good. I I think it's good and I enjoy it. Um, most people won't. But I really like Man of Steel and most people don't. Um, and I'm not a Superman fan. Like I'm not nearly the Superman fan that you are. I appreciate where Zack was going and how he's even explained himself. It was an arc and Justice League was always supposed to be us getting where we got to. Um, even though they just totally screwed it in the Justice League movie. It was always the arc where we were going to get that, get back to that, that ideal of Superman that we know from like Christopher Reeves. It was like this whole arc he was building up of, because like you said, he was more um, an architect in the universe and they just kind of abandoned so much stuff that they had him already put to film and, and write stuff for and shoot stuff for, and then yanked it all away from him. Like, well, no, we got to pivot now because people are saying this is too dark. So, and I think it, they probably would be in a better spot right now if they did a few things. If they had just stuck with him, they, it would have been better and not meddled. And went ahead and gave him Man of Steel 2 when he should have gotten it. And that's what I said. Man, it should have been a Man of Steel 2 
then be Batman versus Superman, then Justice League Part One, or or even Wonder Woman. However you lined it up in there, Wonder Woman, then um, Justice League Part One, and then Part Two, and stuck with the Dark Side stuff because stuff was shot for Dark Side in those in all that Justice League footage that he shot. All the footage wasn't completed as far as the CGI, but it was the, the end scene. When Stephen Wolf gets killed, was Dark Side was a scene of Dark Side in the portal yanking him out to kill him. Like you, you saw him in the movie, you know, essentially, and they cut it out. And now they're gonna do a new guys movie. They're like, yeah, we're gonna do a new guy. You already set up the new guys, but you cut all the film, the footage out of Justice League. Why are you gonna <laughs> yeah. do one now? You took it all away. You had it all set up, and you took it all away. You shot stuff setting up the new gods, and you cut it out. And then you're gonna say now. No, we're going to get the wrinkle in time, lady, to come do new guys. You just denounced it in your film. Everybody knew that's where you were going. And you cut it all out. It, it, he, like all it's the, all reactive. It's not proactive. Right. Reactive. It's totally. It's totally. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it's so frustrating. I, 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 and I want to see them succeed. That's the funny thing. Like you said, it goes back to what you said, too, about the legacy of the characters they have let Marvel copy them and now do it better than them. As far as with the legacy, they went back and added legacy to the Immortal Iron Fist. And there's all this lineage to it. And then, it, this was the crazy part, is I'm watching Iron Fist Season 2, and they set up that whole legacy. Like, how they did that was dope, even though it got canceled on, a Mar- on Netflix or whatever. They set up the whole legacy. It was so cool how they did it in that second season. Of it was that you now know it was different Iron Fist and portrayed it so well on TV and they did it on TV like you said with a, a small way smaller budget just think of what DC is so much more fleshed out and established because you've had epic runs with with um what's um what's the first Green Lantern um Alan Scott Alan Scott Alan Scott I was seeing his face I couldn't remember with well, Alan Scott to then um then to how to um trying to remember all the different Kyle and and John Kyle, and, Kyle, and John yeah. and um Warrior. What's Warrior? Uh the bus the haircut. Guy Gardner. Guy, Guy all, Gardner. All, all, like the whole lineage, man, it's like it's there and you've had runs and you've if you wanted to you have connected to one of those lanterns and then like so it's it's stuff there that you can just mine from and the work has literally already been, been done. done. All you have yeah. to do is take it. They need a Feige. They do. They need a Feige that could be like, yo, we're going to take this bit from this um, story, this bit, this bit, and we're going to add a little bit of new to it and to freshen it up. And then, bam, hit movie. Let's do it. Like they, they, But it's like, who, who, who can you get at this point? Yeah. And the word of mouth is so bad, I almost feel like it's just done. Now, I do still hear from people like, oh, I love those movies. So I know that there's an audience out there, and I don't. Anybody who's listening to this, this is just our opinion. We're not trying to tell you oh, you're yeah. right or wrong yeah, sure. or anything like that. We're just talking about this and, and giving our perspective on it as a couple of longtime comic fans who are probably a little jaded about the whole thing. But and I think but, because but I we feel, come I, from comics. But Go I ahead. still think in everything that we're saying, we're still rooting for them. We want yeah. them to succeed. We don't say they're su- they they suck. I just feel like I think what we're really saying in all this is that. That Warner Brothers and DC Films just keep getting in their own way. They're they're prohibiting their own success because they don't know their product and they don't know their fan base to enough to give them what they truly want. Everything from um, I think the TV shows they got right because they got the right person. Greg Berlanti is on top of that joint. Like I said, and I was like when I watched the first few episodes of Titans, it didn't click. And I was like, yo, the whole ending is just like the CW shows. Berlanti production, blah, blah, blah. Jeff Johns production. And I'm like, oh, that's why it's good. <laughs> I love because it's him. It's him. Because, like, he can make a decent show. And I'm like, it, you know, it, it, it has some of the same, you know, the costumes aren't, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you look at some of the costumes, you'd be like, oh, okay. You know, but they, but they're, but again, with the budget, like, it's amazing. Even what they're doing over the CW shows um, be it like the full on Robin and man they had a crazy episode where um, Jason Todd shows up in the episode so you got the two different Robin suits and they're clearly like different when you see Dick with his Robin suit on and then Jason with his and he was like you know I did these upgrades from 
I, I had the schematics of your outfit and I use this, you know, polyfiber uh, carbonate, you know, to, to, to be stronger so I could do this. Like, he's just breaking the shit down. And it's like, I'm um, breaking it down. <laughs> and, um, and it's like, cool. You know, it's like really cool on like, wow, they really, and you can see a distinct difference between the two, the two costumes and uh, like little subtle things they're doing, like they're building up. Like they release pictures from ep- like some of the later episodes of seeing some more of the main characters in their like official Titans like outfits and how like they're doing like themes of like um, Starfires like she's wearing direct regular clothes but all her clothes always match up to the color scheme of like what her outfit normally is so you can see her like evolve and and like Raven always wear like hoodies and stuff so they do. So much with so little, you know what I mean? It's just like you said with the movies, you can take, um, I really, I never read the original Blackhawks, but, you know, I read the Blackhawks that launched with the new 52, and I thought it was a real unique take, and I was hoping when they were like, Steven Spielberg's gonna do the Blackhawks, and he was like, oh, it's gonna be the, you know, World War II thing, I was like, uh, I would have rather saw how it was in the new 52, where they were kind of like a, a shield, G.I. Joe, elite like spy kind of you could do that you could do that on cheap, cheap. Way that's cheaper. a cheaper thing to make yep. yeah without all the cgi and all the stuff and like they were just regular people that are like on some espionage spy stuff and and, and do that for 100 million 75 million you know dollars you know what i mean like do that and make a good movie and get good people enthusiastic people about the property behind it to do it you know it's like you said there's so many um, you know, smaller, you know, oh, like do something like um, Wildcat or, you know, like, I mean, I mean even though they, I would like, I, you know, here's the thing. I'm of two minds of this. I love Stephen Amell. I don't know if I would want him as Green Lantern in a Green Lantern movie. I mean, a Green Arrow, a Green Arrow movie or not. I don't know because I did not like him in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as Casey Joe, but I think he was miscast more than anything else. But I just don't know how well he translates over to film from TV. That's the only thing with me. I think Grant Gustafson could go straight to film and be Barry Allen and kill it. Like, I just think he, he that he's just that character. Uh, I don't think anybody can play that character better than him at this point um, and nail it like that, like on the same level. Um, I, I, worry, I wonder with that, seeing Stephen Amell... In a movie, playing a role like an action role, um, but it could have been the direction. It could have been. It was definitely the writing for sure, and it was the casting because he just was not the character. Nothing about him screams Casey Jones whatsoever. Um, but it is what it is, you know. But I, I wonder about that. Um, but or like he, you know, that would be an easier movie because he's just a human with a bow and arrow. You know, he doesn't have any superpowers. Like that should have been one of the first movies they probably. Should have tried, and he was a billionaire, so like you could have launched the bigger DC extended universe with maybe Green Arrow and Batman instead of um uh you know super you know Superman and, and Batman or what or what have you or really Superman and didn't follow through like you started. I think that was the biggest mistake. You started with Superman and you didn't follow through with Superman. Superman still he was your first movie done almost ten years ago and he still hasn't gotten a true sequel yet, and one still has not been announced yet. Hasn't it been like almost 10 years later since Man of Steel? About now? It's 2012, but I could be wrong. I think it's been six, but I, I could be wrong. You, if you want to look it up, I'll talk. I, 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 I can't remember. I have a, I'm, I'm hard. I have a, no, here, let's see. I'm, I'm I, pulling it up now, man. You're right. I think it's 20, 2013. So 2013. Five years. So, so, yeah, five, almost. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, so it's still been, like, but too long. But <laughs> too long yeah, too, a, between. Yeah. Like, we definitely should have had a sequel by now. Yeah, especially when they're cranking all this other stuff out. Fast tracking, uh, you know. It, 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 you don't start with your icon and then work backwards from there. You build up to it. But again, you know, it, here's the thing. This is, I'm going to float this theory by you. Or I don't even know if it's a theory as much as it's just an observation. We're coming at this from comic book fan perspectives. This is the comic book spot. And we have a long, deep rooted history with these characters. We've been reading them for you know, decades. But we are not, I don't think we're the audience for this stuff anymore. 
they're going for a stream audience. And I kind of feel like Mar- Marvel has not thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Like Marvel still seems to want to court comic book fans, and they're paying homage to the comics. Like Thanos, like Thanos will come out in the Avengers Infinity War stuff or whatever, and then there'll be all this. There's a push for Thanos in the comics, and then. And there's a lot of Thanos references in that movie to past stuff. Like they, I feel like there's a sense of history there. But Warner Brothers, if I'm reading them correctly, you know, I don't know that anybody's explicitly said it, so I'm having to extrapolate. I'm guessing, but I feel like they don't care what we think. They think they've got this covered. They don't think that the comic books are important. Um, I kind of wonder if we're living in a world where this stuff that we're talking about does not matter anymore. Like, we are such a small niche audience. What, 20,000 comics in each title gets sold every day, every month, or something like that. The comic book readership is at a, I think, an all-time low. Um, do they, should they listen to us? Do they listen to us? I don't know. It's just something I'm thinking about. Like, have we, uh, we're clearly not the audience. For this anymore. They, I don't think they care what we think. Thoughts on that? See, here, here's the thing. I would say yes, but then again, Warner Brothers' message is so mixed because then you look at you look at DC Universe and and Titans. That's clearly for adults. It's for us. Um, a little bit again, a little bit too much to the dark side. A little slim, but they're correcting. I, I, I think they're correcting. Um, then you. So uh, at- let me address that really quick. So who do you think they're marketing? Because they they clearly marketed that, which is what turned me off. They clearly marketed Titans as like. This ain't your daddy's Titans. This is new, grim and gritty Titans. And like, F Batman. And I was like, that is so inconsistent with what I think the Titans are. So that lets me know they're not marketing it to me. I think they're maybe marketing it to teenagers who are angry and who are looking for a darker take on their comic book content. But then you're telling me that that's not what the content actually is. That it's it actually- shifts. It shifts. It's like, so like the first few episodes, like, it's like, why is Dick so angry? Like, that's not his character at all. That's Bruce. And they try to, like, Bruceify him. Kind of like in the beginning of, you know, first few seasons of Arrow. It's like, it's so much that Ollie is like Bruce. Like, he's just so hell-bent on this vengeance thing. You know what I mean? But then you start, they start um, revealing it a little bit. They do a lot of flashback scenes of him when Bruce first gets him. And, and he goes into the mansion and... Um, he, he, it's reported to him that, um, his parents didn't die of an accident. It was, um, a suspected murder and how it triggers him. And he, he acts out a lot and, and it just reveals it over the episodes. It's a slow burn, but then like you start, you start getting more of the story and, and, uh, things that happen with Zuko later after he's caught and a, 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 a choice he made that was uh, very Bruce like, and um, he's struggling with it. It put him down a dark path, and he's lost right now. And he's mad because he's lost, and he's trying to figure out who he is without this pre established thing. Like, I've been with Bruce so long, he's taught me some good things, but I've picked up these bad things as well, and it's not me. But who am I now? I've gotten so lost in it because I've done it for so long. I'm not That's me. Interesting. I'm not me anymore. Like and it's really in the guy. I I um I didn't. I don't watch the um. It's Brandon Dates. I think he was in one of the later um, parts of the Caribbean movie. I didn't see it, but it, they said that's where people know him from. And I was like, I don't know if he's my dick. When I was like the whole angry in the beginning, and and he's vicious. Like he's very Bruce. Like like in his fighting and stuff. Like it's insane. Like it's. <laughs> But it's it's a re like he's totally like gone right now, and and we I think we've all been through so much at some point where like one more thing could just snap us to a point of no return. But he's you know now being coupled with the responsibility of of Raven and how they introduce her into the story, and um, it, it is darker that you know they do things where how Raven is portrayed in the show it is very dark and it's very scary. You got to think about it. Her dad is essentially the devil. He's a demon. She has demon powers that come out of her. She uses them for good, but they never really... Per- they, in anything I've ever read, and I've read the Teen Titans since the Wolfman Perez stuff as a kid in the 80s. Like, 
they were kind of dark for the time, but they're not. It, it was like when you think about it in concept, it's like her dad's a demon and she's part demon. Though she's trying to be good, like it's it's a they're putting uh it's um they're establishing that threatness that is scary and it has like uh and I'm not a horror person. You're more the horror person than I am, but I understand it so you can portray that threat level of how a powerful she is and how potential b how potentially dangerous she could be. To the whole world, like they've established that extremely well, and it's like building up to the whole Trigon thing. And I'm really curious, like if they nail that, this first season will be awesome. I don't know how they're gonna visually do that, but like how scary she is, and like how like when the dark side of her comes out, like possesses her and stuff. They really hoard it up to show like great how powerful Raven and dangerous. Like, kind of how they do with Scarlet, the witch, kind of like in the MCU. Like, they're starting to, you know, you see in Infinity War, like, and they were like, um, not Zuri, but um, the other, the bodyguard character. When she comes out and she, like, grabs the machines and smashes them together and throws stuff everywhere. And she's like, why was she hanging in the back the whole time? Like, they, they're, they're powering her up to be like, she is a Omega level threat. Like, even though she's trying her best to maintain the light in the dark, she's scary as F on that show. Not trying to be, you know, but they, they're making, they're portraying that properly in a in a darker light, but not dark for darkness sake. Like, I think that's a lot of things. They did a lot of things in the trailer to promote the show. Surface level shock value. But yeah. then when you watch the show, you can't just watch the first episode. You can't even really watch the first three. When you hit episode four... All the stuff starts coming together, and each episode thereafter, it just adds on to it. And you're like, "Oh!" And it just like, is it over already? The hour's gone already. Gosh, I gotta wait a whole another week. And that's how it's like when it ended last week. I was like, "Really? I gotta wait a whole another week?" And it's like when Friday comes, I'm waiting till like midnight to come on Friday to be like, so I'll either stay up late Friday to watch the next episode, or like first thing Saturday during the day Saturday, I make sure I watch it. And I'm like, "Dang, I gotta wait a whole another week." Like, it has me hooked like that, that is the character progression, the, the storylines are just so good. And the actors they picked are even the ones that I wasn't quite sure of when I first started watching it. The writing has been there for them, man. And you can see that they're more comfortable because I think now they have a handle on where they're going. So I think we're, it was kind of hiccups in this first season. Whatever they're going to do for the second season, I think the writers, the the people behind the scenes, and the actors, everybody's on point. And it's only going to that, that show's only going to get better as time goes on. If they keep putting the money into it and keep the writing staff together, they have something. They they have something and it's working. So I, and I just hope when the when the next season or whatever comes out that they they have a better handle on how to market it to the larger audience. They, they have to do better than that because I feel like the service should be doing better. You know, my wife was asking me, like, well, do you want to go ahead and sign up for the year? And I had been kind of hesitating just paying month to month. And I was like, oddly enough, I was like, based on the strength of this show and how much I enjoy it, I don't think I'm going to go ahead and sign up for the year. And just, like, I'm interested to see what, if this if any of the other shows are at least as good as this show. I mean, all, I'm all in for just their original content, if nothing else. I'm not even, even going to lie. Yeah, no, that's really good. That, yeah. That's um, that makes me feel better about it. I mean, it's a shame that they have not put as much effort or thought into the comics aspect of it. But again, yeah. I don't think I don't think comics are really their focus anymore. I think that uh, I don't know. Even in Marvel, uh, I feel like uh, they're kind of just juggling balls and running in place right now. It doesn't seem like they're really moving forward with anything. I kind of wonder if. Uh, if everybody's dream now is just to develop these big, huge properties for movies and television. And yeah, comics. that's what it seems like everything's going more towards. You're, you're right. It's like, what about just telling, you know, well, I, you know I'll say certain things and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll be like, well, certain writers, you don't see them doing that. Like you see people like, like Jason Aaron, he just gets on a book and writes a good story. And if they use it, they use it. If they don't, they don't. He does his creator own stuff. He has an option as far as anything that I know. He has an option any of his stuff out. He just... Writes his stories, tells his truth, and I think Southern Bastard's my option. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? Yeah, yeah. He I, he did an interview somewhere, and he did talk about that. I think uh, some time ago. But it doesn't seem like his aim. He just tells the stories, like you know. I guess if someone's interested in it and they pick it up, it's one thing. But I don't. 
I never get the feeling from him. I get the feeling from him when he's writing something. It's something that he he's interested in, and he just loves it, and he just kind of writes his run on it, like with Thor, um, with Star Wars when he was writing that, and he just writes from his you know he writes till he can't write anymore, and then he kind of goes on like I felt like Carrie and Gillian was like that too with his stuff he did over at Marvel his his Darth Vader runs and his Loki stuff that he did a Journey in a Mystery and um. I think he did some Thor, a little bit of Thor. He did some X Men, I think, as well. You know, um, but certain other uh, creators, I think, yeah, that's that's the thing now. Everybody wants to be the next Robert uh, Robert Kirkman. You know, and, and I think the, comp- the company wide, like the, the company mandate too, seems to be like. Uh, I I don't feel now. You know, I'm being. I am jaded, and I think it always comes through when we have conversations like this, but it just seems like when I read X-Men or I read Spider-Man or something like that, I feel like they're pushing ideas for future movies instead of just telling good stories. It always feels like there's an agenda behind everything. Now. Oh, for sure. It's the, it's the te- I feel totally that um, that's the testing ground for Marvel. I think the testing yeah. ground for Warner Brothers is their animated movies. The animated movies and TV are the testing ground for what proves out as a movie, and for um, for uh, Marvel, it's definitely the comic books for sure. And it's crazy because you know I talked about so many years ago. It's great to see that comics were finally influencing the big screen. But I always pose a question at the end of that: at what point where this genre becomes such a huge thing that the reverse starts happening, and what does that mean for us as comic fans? And that's the thing I was predicting years ago is what has come around, and that's where we're at with it now. Is that the you know that the movies and the television shows because they make they can pull up pull get so many more eyes and make so much more money for them is the more important thing, and it's starting to influence the works that they're based on. And you know what does that mean going forward? It's going to be a, you know interesting thing. Um, you know, from that is, um, it won't last forever either. This is a exactly is a cycle, and we got to be thinking about what what will happen when that bubble bursts. Exactly, and I don't think they think far enough in advance to to, um, and it's going to be so self correcting. But I think the thing is um, that when they do, will the fans still be there to help them recover? Are you going to keep pushing further and further to you alienate them uh, so far out of it? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And as far as comics, we're talking about comics, right? Right. We talk about across the board. And comics are some the, the readership is is so poor right now. That's not their focus. Uh, and I've talked about it before. You've talked about it before. It's an upside down triangle. Uh, it used to be a wide base sporting. A narrowing group of titles, you know, uh, millions of people supporting, you know, 40 Marvel titles a month, 40 DC titles a month. Now it's 20,000 people supporting about a thousand books a month. <laughs> I mean, it really, there's about a thousand new comics every single month. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crazy. And they're just flooding this stuff out to keep the revenue coming in, um, to, to keep the lights on, I believe, to keep the publishing division of these things going. And that is not a sustainable model, and it's not going to – I don't see – Every when I hear people talk about this, they say it's amazing that it's worked as long as it has, and I can't see it working much longer. This, this is about to collapse, and when it does, what's going to happen? Are we just going to – I can't imagine we'll ever be like, well, there won't be any comics, but the focus is just no longer on telling good stories month to month. It's a bit after bit after bit. This thing builds into this thing. Uh I, I don't know. They, they, they're they breaking fans. And once those people have left, I don't know that they're coming back. I left monthly comics, and I haven't gone back. I'll read trades, and I'll read hardcovers, or I'll stream some or, you know, do digital collections on like Comixology or something like that. But I left monthly comics because it's not – I can't keep up with it. It's more than I can – it is literally more than I can read and, and still have some sort of a life. Right, exactly, because it becomes a job in itself, even as being – you know, uh, you know, some for me being a podcaster, that whole, you know, everything I do is based on the comic book industry. But I thought that was where, when I thought about this, when I first started the show, it was important to focus on the industry, not just the comics. 
Because at any point, if that's all I was doing, everybody else was doing that. And I felt like the the key to my longevity as a podcaster would be to anything within the industry, because the industry I love, I could talk about and not be pigeonholed to be like, I got to read every current comic book and review. You know, and I did, you know, stretches of where I was doing more so that, you know, in the earlier, in the beginning when I was finding my way. And, and then I got confident in the overall other things that I talked about with the movies and the television shows. And, you know, I was doing that from the very beginning. And then it talk, you know, took off to be the huge thing that it is where, you know, maybe, you know, if I was going full bore at it about probably if I just covered, if I covered every TV show and every movie, I could just do a podcast and have weekly content based upon that with news updates and everything else and just that. But I like the freedom of what strikes my fancy at any given point that's a part of this comic book industry that we could uh, I could freely talk about bringing other people on have you know just discussions like this this free open discussions about where the comic book industry is how it is affecting us personally or in as a group as a whole and and um, be able to have that conversation at any given point in time because it's constantly like we're saying now it's constantly in flux and it's always changing it's ever changing so it's always a relevant conversation to to be had, you know, points to be shared. So I, I'm glad that I, I you know, I chose that because I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't read them, you know, like certain books I dabble with, but I'll be all I, I like stuff I review. I, I'm all over the place because I, some of the newer stuff I don't do events. I stopped doing events. Civil War first Civil War broke me with events and tie-ins and everything. I haven't went in full bore on one since then. I, I'll never, rem- I'll never forget sitting on my floor in the house that I was staying in at the time, and I had a hundred and twenty-seven issues that all <laughs> had Civil War. I had them spread out on the floor because I had every single issue, ordering them through DCBS, and and it was all the different tie-ins, the original series, the tie-ins, the aftermath tie-in books. And I had 127 issues of what was supposed to be a seven-issue comic book event. And I said, I'm done. At that point, I was done with event comic books. And I haven't looked back since. And um, It's only gotten worse since then. Yeah. I was only- trying to read... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was trying to read the... I was trying to get caught up on X-Men, which is... I've decided now it's just impossible. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, but I was trying to do... So was, I started with the... Uh, the, the X Men, uh, all new X Men when they had gone back in time, like right? He said back in time to get the original X Men and brought them to the future. And I was like, well, this will be it's a cool jumping off point. I love the original X Men team, and it kind of brings fresh life to it. And it kind of it's, it's its own thing, but it's also a doorway into the X Men universe. And I quickly discovered that you can't read more than eight issues of any title, even even books that start at number one at Marvel. You really can't go more than eight issues without it connecting to something else that you feel like you have to read. So, like, I started with that, and by issue eight, it had tied into a crossover event that you had to read the rest of the X Men books to figure out what was going on. Spider Man, you had it, like eight issues. Eight issues is the minimum there, like, or the, the maximum there, and that says something about continuity. About, I mean, that title ended too, and then they rebooted it into what X Men Blue, and then there's X Men. Well, there, there is no status quo. And for someone, like, even, you know, at Serial at Midnight, I get people asking me on my videos, I'm trying to get into comics. I, I love the movies, and I'm trying to get into comics, but I don't know how to do it. Every time I try, there's just too many choices. Like X-Men, for example. I, I want to read X-Men. How do I wrap my arms around X-Men? Like, what's the best end for that? And there is no answer, because there, they, there isn't one. Yeah. It's, it's like... Yeah, well, unless you're willing to read about 30 books a month, uh, sorry, you're not going to be able to catch up with the X-Men. But you're better off with the movies. Or the classic stuff, which, you know, like, uh, you know, I yes. picked up, um, I picked up Mutant Massacre. Ones. I picked up Mutant Massacre. Um, I want to go back and read Operation Zero. Was it Zero Tolerance? Yeah, I think it was Zero Tolerance. It was the one with Bastion and hunting down... Uh, he took like Xavier and all them off the board. I really liked it at the time. Um, I want to get uh, one of my favorite runs of the X Men was the um, Australian Outback uh, X Men, and I want to get that. They're collecting in and around it because um, it's shortly after the whole um, mutant massacre and uh, Inferno stuff is somewhere around there. So I'm seeing 
they, they're releasing like epic collections. So I'm trying to get the the one that just captures the, that Australian run because I want to. I haven't read it since it came out originally as a kid. And those are the X Men books that are pulling to me right now that I want to read. Like any of the current stuff, I don't know when I last last read a current X Men book. I don't even mess with yes. like the current book. Like if it ain't something on the fringe, like Star Wars or or um, I liked when they did. Um, it was Wade uh, Rucka and somebody else, and they did like big shots, and it was like Daredevil, Punisher. And I like that because they did it. They did one little crossover between those three books at the time, and maybe it was like a Vengeance Spider Man or something like that, or something that was out at the time. And it was one three issue story arc that ran through the three books. It was one issue of each book, um, and it was it was good. And I like I liked I was reading Wade's Daredevil at that time. I was reading Rucka's Punisher, and I was enjoying all those books, but it didn't, they all didn't extend that into the, the larger MCU. They had the one event that crossed over between their books, and that was it. And then they, they ran, I think, Rucka's book ran for 20-some issues, and then he did Punisher Warzone, which was a like a big, like a, a the culmination of his Punisher run, and, and um, you know, Wade went on to do multiple volumes of Daredevil, and... And I can't remember what the other book was now, but you know, whatever. But it was contained, and I was like, so I'll deal with those books more so. But then that's where it pushes me away from the big two, and, I, and it's crazy. Like I still buy DC Comics, but I, I'm like, so I've been behind on DC Comics for I don't know for it's, it's been so much stuff. I mean, I was there for the New Fifty Two, and I was in there hard, and somewhere between the New Fifty Two and then like Rebirth, like certain titles. I was reading and I kind of fell off from that. And it's like, now we got whatever is going on it right now. And uh, DC, I don't know. And it's like, but I still care about those characters. So occasionally like, like, um, I picked up, I was looking at sales in, um, on Comixology and they did like, um, they did these great volumes of the, um, Tom King, Batman stuff where it was like, you get 20, I want, let me see. I'm, let me look through my purchases because I have so many purchases on there. You know it's bad when you see your recent per, recently purchased list on on Comicsology, and then I own two thousand three hundred and seventy comic books on Comicsology. That's that's a problem. I realize that. I, I, I realize that. No, I, I, that's that's good. Well, they got good deals and stuff. Yeah. Why are you looking at that? Let me ask you though. Wouldn't it be? I mean, I don't know what we're about. But if they had, if Marvel cut down to twenty-five core titles, DC cut down to twenty-four core, like twenty-five core. Like when Joe Casada came in as the head of chief, the editor in chief at, uh, at Marvel in the early two thousands. That was the first thing he did. Is he cleaned he cleaned house. Straight, he's like, we're publishing way too much stuff. People cannot keep up with what we're doing. Let's go back to basics. So it went back to X Men and Uncanny X Men, Amazing Spider Man, I think Peter Parker Spider Man, one of Avengers title. That's when they went through the whole Avengers disassemble thing. That was Punisher, Warzone. I think no, Punisher, um, Punisher Max. They cut it down to like twenty five titles. It may have been a little bit more than that, but it was approachable, and you could follow most of what was going on. He said no events for a while. Let's just have a status quo where people can reconnect with these characters, and that was like a second golden age for me. I was able to follow so much, and I felt really connected to that universe. I could read Hulk, and I could read Spider-Man, and I, I was reading a lot of it, and I was getting most of what was happening in the Marvel Universe. Uh, DC at that time was a lot more approachable, too. If they could cut back to that, if they, if they could go back in time, just get rid of all these... The, I think there's 13 X-Men books every single month. Uh, not, not joking. There's like 13 ongoing X-Men titles. If they could just get back to about 25 core titles from each company, would you be all in or close to all in? I think I'll be more receptive to it, way more receptive to it. Because, yeah, it, it's like you said, it's so daunting in looking at it that you don't you don't even want. <laughs> like, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. So, okay, so here's what I was looking for. So, like, this is what, this is where DC gets me sometimes. It's only sometimes. So, like, they had a sale and they, they put out these Rebirth Deluxe editions. So they did, for, for Batman, Tom King's run on Batman, they did uh, Batman Rebirth Deluxe Edition Book 1 and Book 2. So you got, um, it collects Batman Rebirth the issue issue 1, and then when Batman launched the first 15 issues. So you get like 16 issues 
I think it retails for like twenty five bucks. When it was on sale, I want to say it was like seven ninety nine or eight ninety nine or whatever. So you got fifteen issues for you know sixteen issues for you know under twenty bucks, which is unheard of now. But it was a good sale, and he did version one and version two, and he did the same thing for like Detective Comics. And I was looking today because they have this massive sale. At the time you are hearing this, you should be hearing this uh, finished product very soon, um, that they have a huge sale on Aquaman. And I was like, well, they did them on the Batman titles, but I'm, they had this huge sale because the movie's coming out. And the sale literally runs for this whole month. It ends January 2nd next year. So they have all these trades. And I'm like, yo, especially for the Rebirth stuff, since they're pulling from a lot of the Rebirth stuff. Why don't they have a big compendium like they did with the, the Batman have book one and two and, and have them on sale and they're like eight or nine bucks or whatever. Because so, you're pulling a lot from that from what I've heard. So why wouldn't you, instead of having these five and six issue trades, not have a 15, 16 issue epic thing, double it up. So if someone's really like interested into the character, they can full, full dive in and be like really versed in the character. Or after they go see the movie, they're going to want to read Aquaman like, why would you nickel and dime them? Like, with, if I want to get this story, so with that, so it's essentially what, like, three trades worth, essentially, and what I was just talking about with the Batman and Detective Comics thing. Well, to get the equivalent of that, and it was like eight ninety nine or seven ninety nine. I can't remember which one it was. It wasn't more than that. So, like, to get the equivalent of that, I'm looking at it right now. So I would have to get three trades to get the same equivalent, equivalent um, amount of issues and then you're paying 15, and that's before tax, like 15 bucks to get the same amount of issues where I can pay half the amount. Like, quit nickeling and diming them and, like, give them a reason to want to buy and consume your your content. I feel that's where Marvel makes a killing, like, with digital. Like, they'll be like, yo, this is this throwaway series. Like, if you, you know, like, they'll be like, oh, here's the first issue free on Comixology Unlimited. Hey, but by the way, check this out. Hey, you want the trade? You can get the whole five, the six issue trade. We gave you the first issue for free, but hey, buy this for two fifty. I, I, you got me. I'm sorry. I don't even know if I ever read it, but just based on that, I like the first issue enough for two dollars and fifty cent. I'm gonna buy it, sir. I can't help myself. I'm cheap. Yeah. I'm gonna buy it because comics <laughs> are so a, expensive. And you're not a, cheap. It's it's just a good bargain. You're right. Bargain. It's, I'm thrifty. We're thrifty, my friend. That's no, but I'm serious. But it's not you're not buying it because you're spending money, so you're not being cheap. But you're buying it because it's a, it's, it's they're giving you a good bargain. Yeah, and I think DC is so horrible with that. Like I buy, I buy so many more like the amount of books I buy digitally. I buy so much more Marvel and Image and um, IDW through Comicsology because most of the time, I'm not gonna lie, DC sales really suck. Unless it's something I feel like I just have to have. That's DC. I buy a lot less DC digitally because the deals are always like you know like that's not really a deal you know what i mean like it's like that's not the deal i want i want some of these 250 and i could get you know and and gosh you know and um even like black friday like i didn't pick up i didn't pick up anything it was one thing i wanted to pick up and i didn't grab it in time and then it went off sale and that was the one thing i really because i've heard so much about it was um the sean murphy batman white knight I think it's what it's called. And they had the the um, the completed the first part of because I think they've extended it and he's going to do more. Um, and I was I wanted to pick that that trade up of the first twelve issues, and they had it for like four ninety nine, and now it's back to like ten or twelve bucks or something, something crazy. And I'm like, uh, hopefully I can catch it on sale again. So I like I kind of missed out on that. But um, but that was it. Everything else they like their pricing is just like it's too much. You know, Marvel the other companies are giving you incentive to want to to try or continue to read their books because they will give you good values and, you know, or reasonable prices at least. I feel like these, I look at all the other companies that always, and they still constantly alternate on Comixology, and it always seems like DC is always the highest price out of any of the sales you'll ever come across through all the other publishers on there. They always have the highest prices with their sales going on. It's like it's, it's, that brings us that brings us full circle back to Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. Just being tone back. deaf to their to their fan base. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. That might be a good place to put a pen in it. Yeah, I think we in in we didn't talk about the original thing that we we're supposed to talk about on this episode. We really just started 
Um, we kind of always do a pre-chat before we go into recording the episode, and we were just talking about uh, planning shows in the future and what we were going to cover, and it kind of just spilled into a really good conversation that we just um, decided to kind of go with and record from this picked up. So in the beginning of this episode, you'll kind of hear the, an abrupt beginning of a conversation because we were already in the middle of one. Um, there's no way to really edit that up. It was just, we were like, just hit record. Like, this is good, you know. Um, and it's just us being honest about being comic book fans and what we want. Um, he tell everybody where they can find you at. Uh, SerialAtMidnight.com. YouTube, YouTube.com slash SerialAtMidnight. He's a big YouTuber now. He's trying to help me become a big YouTuber. Hopefully, if I keep hanging around him, some of his magic dust will uh, fall on me, and I'll become magically uh, famous on YouTube as well. You know what? I was thinking that maybe that, yes, I hang out in the VIP lounge. Yes. Uh, that, the, the conversation we were originally going to have, the topic mm-hmm. that we got to, so maybe we should do that at Serial at Midnight on uh, Skype video chat. Yes. I'm down for doing that. that. Yeah, we definitely need to do that. We definitely need to start doing some collab videos as well as not just doing the podcast thing as, as well. Um, you can always find me at Um uh, It is the holiday season, and I have I still have, from the last contest I attend, uh, attended, attempted to uh, run, um, I still have like four bundles of uh, comic books that are sitting here that I need to give away. So the first four people that email me at comicbooksavant at gmail.com or you can even just go to the website. You can it's a contact me page there. The four the first four people that um, email me their name and address, um, I will send them a bundle of comics <laughs> uh, for the holiday season. Uh, you know, like I said I've been sitting here and I was gonna do some elaborate contest and I, I didn't like the way the last contest kind of went and. If you made it to the end of all this and you stuck around, you deserve to to uh, get rewarded for it. And like I, I just free love, comics, yeah, free comics. Um, it's it's a, a bundle that includes trades, single issues, bagged and boarded, like the whole nine. It's I, I if you go back on my Instagram and look back at the different bundles I had before, um, you'll see it's a mixture of like I said, trade, single issues. The comics are bagged and boarded. The the trades are. In, in great condition, so um, I, I have four bundles, so the first four emails I get with your name and address on, I will have those shipped out to you, and you should definitely get them before uh, Christmas time, so just contact me, or even if you want, you can hit me up on Instagram on uh, at Comic Book Savant, so the first four people that contact me with their information will be the uh, first four people that I will be sending the stuff off to. So, the uh, downside is that every it's just twenty copies of all new X Men number. If you want to read, you want to follow the story, you got to go get a crossover. Exactly, you got to cross over to the other ones. Uh, yeah, so definitely uh, just reach out to me on that, and that's all we have for you guys in this episode. This is uh, what, what episode of Spinner Rack Bros is this? Like three, four, four, three, four. I don't three, four. Uh, who knows? It's the latest one. Yes, it's the latest. It's the latest and greatest one. Uh, we will see you guys next time, and uh, you guys take care. Until next time, we uh, see us. Bye. Bye.